Uh, my name is Ellen Holsey. I am the Community Program Manager at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute. And we're going to go through today a little bit about what lichen is, some common growth forms of lichen, and then how you guys can go out and actually identify lichen. So those are some of the things we're going to be talking about today. So to start us off this, this afternoon, I have some true-false questions for you, and I'm going to put up a poll if you are in Zoom. If you're on Facebook Live, just feel free to type in the chat. So my first question for you is true or false? Lichen are picky about the environment that they can live in. What do you think? Do you think that's true or do you think that is false? And there is no problems if you don't get this right. Uh, we're just trying to have some fun here today. So uh, a lot of people looks like are thinking it is true that they are picky about the environment that they live in. I am going to end this poll in three, two, and one. And the answer is false. Lichen can actually live in almost every environment and they're really good at living in extreme environments. So on really rocky areas and really, really cold areas, so even snowy areas, they also can live in really, really dry areas, so in the desert. Uh, so lichen are one of those organisms that can live almost everywhere. All right, well, let's go to our next one. So here's another true false. Lichen, oops, let me move that pole. Lichen is a type of moss. So what do you think, true or false? Lichen is a type of moss. And as I said, if you're on Facebook Live, feel free to just type that into the chat there. All right, so it looks like most people are saying, most people's votes are in, most people say it is false. I'm gonna end that poll right now. And most people would be correct. So lichen is actually a, what they call a symbiotic relationship. It's a relationship um, usually beneficial between multiple organisms. And we'll go over what those organisms are in just a bit. But the, a lot of times they do live right next to moss. So if you see in this picture, this is moss. This is actually a couple of species of lichen. Um, and so people really get them confused because they can be similar colors and they live right next to each other. So, all right, let's try our next one. All right, true or false? Lichen can live for thousands of years. What do you think? So I know humans can live for about 100. Some trees can live for much longer than that. What about lichen? Oh, most people are definitely saying true on this one. Oh, let's find my little cursor and we're gonna close that poll in three, two, and one. And everybody is correct, yes. Lichen live, can live for thousands of years. Uh, some map lichen, so this is just a group of lichen, they're called map lichen, uh, has been documented to live between 3,000 and 5,000 years old. So lichen can live a really, really, really long time. All right, I think I've only got a couple more for you guys. I'm gonna relaunch that poll one more there. Lichen have a root system, just like plants. What do you think? Is that true or false? Do lichen have roots? True or false? So it looks like we're kind of divided on this one. Some say true, some say false. Most people have voted, but I'm gonna wait just a couple more seconds and close that poll in three, two, one. And the answer is false. Lichen actually don't have a true root system like we think of as roots that can actually pull up that water. They get all their nutrients actually that they need from the air or the atmosphere. Um, and so they usually use only little anchors. We'll talk about those anchors in just a bit to help them hold on to things, but it doesn't help them take up anything just like roots would do. So, all right. And this is our last one true or false? Lichen. Let me move that over. Lichen cover up to 8% of the Earth's land. What do you guys think? Is that true or false? I know it's a pretty specific number. Uh, we're getting lots of people voting. I love it. Keep on coming in. What do you think? Lichen can cover up to 8% of the Earth's land. Looks like most people have voted. So I'm going to close that in three, two, and one. And the answer is most of you guys are correct. It is true. Uh, some estimates are anywhere between six to 8%, but lichen cover a lot of the Earth's land. So they're all over the place. And I think I just saw somebody put a question in. 
Uh, do like, do, how do researchers tell how old lichen are like the map lichen? We'll go over that in a little bit later. So I will answer that question, but I'm just gonna answer it in just a little while, okay? All right, so what actually is a lichen? Well, there are about 18,000 lichen worldwide. And as some of you put in the chat box earlier, some have seen orange, light green, gray, uh, purple lichen. Uh, lichen can many, be many different colors and they're found all over the world. In North America alone, there are 3,600 different types of lichen. And in Michigan alone, I know you guys are coming from many different places, but in just one state, in the state of Michigan, there are 800 different types of lichen. So even on one branch or one simple sugar maple tree, there can up be up to 20 different lichen on that one tree. And you can see in this picture, Right here is one lichen, if you see my cursor. Up here is another type. Up down here is another. Right here is another. Over here, it looks very similar to this one, but you can have many different types of lichen all in one place. And you can find them in many different places. So you can find them, for example, on fence rows. You can find them on rocks. You can find them on benches. You can find them on the ground, on trees, on our roofs, which we don't necessarily like to have. Um, you also can find them in many different habitats. So in the tundra, uh, seasides, tropical rainforests, temperate forests, you can find them in Antarctica, uh, sand dunes, um, I'm failing finding, there we go, deserts all over, even in prairies. So they're found all over. The other place you can actually find them, in space. So one type of lichen they actually brought to the International Space Station and it was able to survive in space for a fair amount of time. So you can find lichen literally everywhere. <laughs> uh, and lichen has many different uses. Uh, so it can be used as a pH indicator on litmus paper. So it tells you how basic or acidic it is. Uh, sometimes lichen has been found in de our deodorants, our toothpaste, our perfumes, uh, in our home decor. So if you've ever used reindeer moss, for example, um, in some of your home decor, that is actually a lichen, it's not a moss. Uh, some people eat lichen as well as animals. Uh, it's also used in medicine as well as dye. So lichens have lots of uses for us as humans as well as many wildlife. And then they're also really important to help soil form. So they help break down that soil sometimes. They're a good plant health indicator. And they're also really good telling us what our air quality is. And we'll go over especially that last one uh, towards about the middle of this presentation. Uh, but that gives you, like tells you how important lichen really can be. All right, so what actually is a lichen? This is something that we get a lot and it's something that can be kind of confusing. So let's go over a little bit what exactly is a lichen. So first off, lichen's not a moss, all right? So even though there are some lichen that are called moss, such as reindeer moss or Spanish moss, or excuse me, reindeer moss, they are not uh, they're not a moss, they are a lichen. Um, and moss is basically just a simple plant with root-like structures. Um, lichen is not a plant. It, that's not just what it is. Um, if I did a quick search just of pictures of lichen, this is what came up. And it's interesting because if you look, a lot of these pictures, when you just type in lichen, they're actually moss or a mushroom, for example. So One's moss, here's another moss, here's another moss. There might be some lichen in there. There's another moss, but a lot of people get moss confused with lichen because as I said previously, they tend to grow in the same areas. But, all right, so lichen is what they call a symbiotic relationship. So what I mean by a symbiotic relationship. So first partner, we have a fungus, all right? So fungi, when you think of that, a lot of people think mushrooms. Second partner, is either algae or a cyanobacteria, and those together make a lichen. So that's what we've always known a lichen to be. It's a partnership between a fungus and an algae or a cyanobacteria, all right? And that's what makes up a lichen. And we've known this for about 150 years or so. Uh, a man by Simon, oh man, I'm gonna not be good on his last name, but Shai Weininger, uh, he was a botanist and he basically discovered this dual nature of lichen way back in 1867. 
but a lot of people didn't believe him. There was a lot of skepticism about this. Um, I like to always bring up Beatrix Potter. So if you guys know Beatrix Potter, the person who wrote uh, Peter Rabbit and all those other wonderful books, she was actually a mycologist. She loved to study fungus, basically. So a mycologist studies fungi. Uh, so before she wrote Peter Rabbit, she studied fungus. Um, and she would write people about all these different mushrooms that she was drawing. Uh, this is actually one of her drawings here in the middle. She wrote papers about fungus. She wrote papers about mushrooms. Um, and the debate was going on even in the early 1900s of whether lichen was actually this symbiotic relationship. And she was very much a proponent, proponent of saying, yes, lichen is this. Uh, if you read a book about her, there's a book that I will suggest later, you get to read the good story of how she would eat, uh, write people and, and really say, no, a lichen is a symbiotic relationship. So I just found that quite interesting. But a lichen is basically a love story, all right? So a good way of remembering what a lichen is, so a fungus, and remember that algae or bacteria. So Freddy the fungus was a great builder, but all that hard work made him hungry. One day, Freddy fungi smelled something delicious. Hmm. Surprise, he met Alice and algae, or you could say Sybil cyanobacteria. Using the sun's energy, she was cooking sugar through the process of photosynthesis. Alice algae uh, thought Freddy was a fun guy. Freddy took a lichen to Alice. Freddy fungus went out a limb by building a nice home for them. Better together, Freddy and Alice announced their symbiotic relationship in a ceremony. I now pronounce you lichen. So it's a good way of remembering that a lichen is that relationship between the two things. But it also is a good way of remembering that the fungus actually brings the structure. So remember, Freddy was the builder. Uh, the fungus actually brings the structure to the lichen, whereas the cyanobacteria and the algae actually brings the food to the relationship because a fungus can't make its own food. So in Michigan, a lot of times we think of fungi and we think of morels uh, or we think mushrooms, right? Uh, but there are actually over 1.5 million fungal species worldwide. And of those 1.5 uh, million fungal species that have been described right now, one in five fungal species live in a lichenized relationship. So live in this relationship with an algae or a cyanobacteria. So quite a few. And when you think about fungi, they tend to get broken down into two, two groups. So I'm not going to go too far into the weeds in terms of the taxonomy, but I do want you guys to know these two groups. Uh, so there are two major groups of fungi. One are called basidiomycetes, and these are what we typically think of as mushrooms, all right? So they're the bolates, the chanterelles, the guild fungus, the puffballs. Those are all the ones that are called the basidiomycetes. The other group of fungi are the ascomycetes. So these are what they call the sac fungus or the cup fungus, and this accounts for about 75% of all described fungi. Uh, so this could be like our morels, our truffles, our cup fungus, all of those fall into this category. Um, and really the main difference between these two other than the, obviously the way they look is just how they reproduce. Uh, so the basidiomycetes tend to have gills uh, or something called a basidium that produces spores and spores are like the seeds of the fungus. Whereas the ascomycetes tend to have these cup type reproductive structures, right? So that's the main difference between those two that we're really concerned about. And in lichen, most of the lichenized fungi, so most of the fungi that are in this relationship in a lichen come from the ascomycetes. So um, and in a way, they're kind of called ascolichens uh, for that reason. So remember, that's like that cup fungus or those morels that we think of here in Michigan. Um, but less than 50%, so remember there were uh, 18,000 uh, different lichen in the world, only 50 lichen associate with the basidiomyces, so, so that are basidio lichens. So mainly think most of the fungus that associates with a lichen are in those ascomycetes families. 
Now in that lichen, we also have that algae and that cyanobacteria. So basically all these two things are doing is they're making the food. So they're the chef in the relationship. Uh, they can photosynthesize and make food. Remember fungi, fungi can't make its own food. Fungi actually gets its um, nutrients from its environment. It's a lot more related to animals than it is to plants in that way. They can't photosynthesize. So a fungus needs that algae or that cyanobacteria in order to have some sort of food source, some sort of energy source. And so that's what the algae and the cyanobacteria really bring to the relationship. The other thing that they bring to the relationship is a lot of the color. So you guys were talking about all those wonderful colors uh, that you found for, for lichen. Well, the colors can be different whether the lichen is wet or dry. So the colors might be a little bit more vibrant if they're wet. Um, but a lot of times the colors are due to that photosynthetic partner. So due to that algae or due to that cyanobacteria. So if it's a green algae that is producing, uh, is in that lichen relationship, usually you're gonna get a bright green color out of your lichen. Whereas if it's a cyanobacteria, a lot of times you're gonna get a dark green or a brown or a black color. Now where those yellows and those reds and those purples and those blues come from, those are different pigments. Uh, so just like our leaves in the fall have carotenoids in them um, and, and they have all sorts of other things that help make them those different colors, there are also special pigments in our lichen that help them make colors as well. All right, let me see what that's check. All right, so for 150 years, this is what we've known lichen to be. It's that symbiotic relationship um, between cyanobacteria and algae that are basically make the colors and are the chef of the relationship and the fungus that's basically the builder of the relationship. It produces that structure that we think of for that lichen. However, all right, here, here's where the complication comes in. Sometimes you have the same cyanobacteria or that same algae and the same fungus together, but they are different. Uh, so scientists had a conundrum for quite a while. They noticed, for example, on these two different type of lichens, the tortured horsehair lichen versus the edible horsehair lichen. Um, one was more of a green yellow color, whereas the other was more of a chocolate brown color. And one contained a toxin, which made it non-edible, whereas the, obviously the, the edible horsehair is edible and does not contain the toxin. And they couldn't figure out why why this was the case because it had the same two partners that we think of are in a lichen relationship. It wasn't until 2016, four years ago, that scientists actually discovered, eh, we kind of got it wrong for about 150 years. They found actually a third partner in the relationship. So partner number one, LG cyanobacteria. Partner number two, that fungus. Partner number three is actually another type of fungus. So it's a yeast, but it is a basidiomycete yeast. So remember, most of the fungus that is so associated in these lichenized relationships are an ascomycete. So they produce those cups a lot of times. Um, so it's just another type of fungus that's in the relationship that helps bring out different characteristics in the lichen. And think of it like, as far as we know right now, it's kind of like the security guard in the relationship. So if it's producing a toxin, it's going to help protect uh, the lichen from being, for example, eaten. And they discovered in 2016, again, about 50 of the 400 lichen genera, so this is a way of classifying lichen, have this third partner. So quite a few of them do have this third partner. Not all have those three partners, so we didn't get everything wrong for 150 years but some of them do have this third partner. All right, so how do we classify or organize lichen? Because not only do they have potentially two different things in them, they could have up to three different things in them. Um, and so this is where it gets a little, a little sketchy. Um, they tend to be classified by their fungal partner. You have to pick something. So they tend to be classified by the fungal partner, not by the, um, the cyanobacteria or the algae. And most of them are in one type, um, one fungal grouping, uh, and it's in the ascomycetes uh, grouping. 95% of all fungi in this group are lichenized, and most of the 18,000 lichen that we have worldwide are in this group. Now, this is the farthest I'm gonna get into those weeds, uh, because I really want you to, to really understand lichen a little bit more. 
but if you ever wanted to get more into the taxonomy, this is an important thing to know. If it's a Basidio lichen, they're in the agromycetes family. Uh, those are the agri agrics. Uh, so when you think of fly, fly agric, uh, it's in that family or the, the uh, corals and stuff like that. But there's, as I said, only 15 di 50 different lichenized uh, species in that group. So a better way to classify lichen and how most people classify lichen, um, unless you want to get into the taxonomy, uh, is crustose. So we're, gonna, we're just going to go through a couple here. So crustose, which is basically crusty lichen. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a second so you can see, and I've got some crustose lichen here. So when we think of crustose lichen, and hopefully you guys can see it, um, it's the lichen that tends to be really crusty or really, really attached to uh, the whatever it's on, the rock or the tree branch or the stick. It is the kind that it kind of reminds me of paint on a paint stick. It is really hard to get off. It's really hard to peel off. Uh, it's really crusted on there. Um, so, or if you bake a, bake a pie and you get spill some and so crusted onto your oven. Um, so that's why they call it crustose or the crusty lichen. Um, all right, so then let me sh share my screen again so you guys can see the next type that we're gonna talk about. So the next type we're gonna talk about, the next major form is what they call folios or leafy lichen. So I will talk about it as folios because that's what mo most people say in a lot of books, it's called folios lichen uh, for that grouping. And I'm gonna stop sharing because I've got a couple here. But folios lichen tends to look really leafy and you can kind of see it here. Um, they come up a little bit more. So they're more two dimensional, um, a little bit more than the last one, the crustose ones. Um, you can notice also that the color is different on one side than the other side. So this is more of a greenish color. This is more of a whitish or a lighter color. Um, but you can really pry up a little corner of the leafy or the, the folios lichen. So think of fo foliage um, or fuller, anything related to leaves, that's what this grouping is, okay? All right, and then, unfortunately I don't have one of the next one, but the next one is, um, the next one is fruct fructicose or shrubby lichen. So this is what we think of when we think of reindeer moss. Uh, when we think reindeer moss, we think of that shrubby stuff. It's really more three-dimensional. Um, and so those are the three major groups. You've got your crustose, your folios, and your fructicose. So your crusty, your leafy, and your shrubby. There is one more group that a lot of books go into. It's called squamulose. Uh, they call it scaly lichen um, because it kind of looks like little scales. But a lot of books just kind of put that in with crust, uh, crustose or folios. It kind of goes, is that in between category between those two, so between crusty and leafy. Um, so we're not going to really focus on the squamulose today. We're mainly going to focus on the crustose, the folios, and the fructicose. So crusty, leafy, shrubby. Those are the three main categories when you're looking for lichen. Those are the three you're wanting to think about, okay? All right. So, and usually crustose and squamulose is classified as micro lichen. Um, so these are difficult to see with the naked eye when you're trying to look at little structures, whereas macro lichen are the ones that you see those really, really big lichen. Um, all right, so micro, macro, this is the forms we're gonna be going over today. Before we go over those, I do wanna kind of give you some pointers on, if you look in lichen books, these are some terms you may see. Um, so, most lichen, the structure of lichen is going to start off with that dense uh, fungal layer. So they're going to call it the cortex. So this is like the outer skin. So if you think of your skin, that cortex is that outer skin. And that's all that fungal hyphae that's up there. All right. And hyphae is basically like thread-like strands. Right underneath the skin is that algal or that cyanobacteria layer. And then underneath that is all lots of loose hyphae, so lots of loose fungal material. Um, and that's called the med medulla. And all of that is called the thallus. So that's basically the body of the lichen. Um, so if they say the thallus is a little bit more erect or a little bit more upright, they're talking about that main body of the lichen. 
Um, the only reason I'm bringing up these terms is I want you guys to know what these terms are. So if you do flip through a book and are trying to identify a particular lichen, you'll know what these terms are. So cortex, remember skin, uh, they call it the photobiont biont layer, which is that algal layer or that cyanobacteria layer right underneath the, the cortex, and then the medulla is just right underneath. Um, all right, so first form we're gonna go over is crustos lichen. And I'm gonna give you some main groups within these groups even um, to help you identify things. So in our crusty lichen or our crustos lichen, more than half of all lichen species worldwide, so more than half of that 18,000 species or lichen worldwide are in this crustose group. So there's a lot in this group. Um, they tend to have a very loose medulla. So for example, remember I said it's like paint on a paint stick for this one? Um, it, I mean loose in the sense that you can't really bring it up like you can the leafy lichen. So it's a lot more, the, the hyphal strands are more loose, but they are really attached to that substrate, whatever they're growing on. Um, and one of the main structures that you need to think about in crustose is the fruiting body. So in a fungus, usually what you see above ground, that mushroom part is what they call the fruiting body. Um, and remember, a lot of the lichens are associated with those cup fungus. So they're gonna have more of a cup-like structure as its fruiting body, or what I mean by fruiting body, this is where it helps to reproduce. And in a lichen, it's called apotheosium. So they may say the apotheosium, it looks like this. That's what you're looking for, okay? And I want to actually stop sharing my screen for one second, because I have a really good example of one right here. All right, let's see if I can get it close enough. You see those with the black dots? Those are the apotheosia, and we'll show some pictures in just a second, but right by my finger, they look like little circular discs almost, all right? So that's what you're looking for when you're looking for the apotheosia. All right, so let's get into it. So, oops, and there I got it. So those are the apotheosia. That's what you're looking for, those circular discs or cup-like discs is what you're looking for. All right, so, one of the first groups within that crustose group is rim lichen. And what we mean by rim is the apotheosia, so those cups, have almost a rim around them. So they'll be darker or lighter colored or a different color in the center than they will be on the outside. Um, and there's many different types of rim lichen. You see three different here, um, but that's what you're looking for for rim lichen. And yes, this webinar can be viewed later, uh, else it will be on our Facebook Live page as well as on our YouTube page later. So if you need to leave in the middle, feel free to do so. All right, uh, fire dot lichen is another type. It's usually orange in color with a dotted apotheosia. So it looks like little dots or fire dots since they're orange in color. Um, you also will get all this information. At the end, I will give you a link to all these different groups. So don't feel the need to write everything down frantically. Um, I'm gonna give you a lot of these slides that I'm showing right now so you can refer back to them later. So yeah, you're looking for those little orange dots for fire dot lichen, and they're all found within the same genus. So some are called sulfur fire dot, granite fire dot, because it's mainly found on granite, uh, common tree fire dot, and where do you think that one's found, right? On a tree, potentially. Um, but yeah, that's what you're looking for when you're looking for fire dot lichen. And the cool thing about this one is there was actually a lichen that was discovered in 2007, and it was named in honor of Barack Obama. And it was a fire dot lichen. Colop oh, I'm really bad on my scientific names. I apologize. Coloplasia Obama. -y. Um, and it was the scientists wanted to honor Barack Obama in support of science and scientific education. So lichen are still being discovered even now. Um, as evidence of 2007 right there. So, all right, another type of crustose lichen, a very common one is disc or button lichen. And they tend to have, as you can see, those apotheoses that I talked about, those reproductive st structures um, right here, those all look like little dots or little buttons on them. Um, 
And the, the interesting thing about these, these are different than the rim lichen. So if you remember the rim lichen, they tended to have a, a different color or a rim around these dots, whereas this is all the same colors you can see here on the black one or this brownish color or this darker one. Um, so that's a good way of telling the difference between disc as, and um, the rim is that difference right there. All right, wart lichen. Hmm, I wonder why it's called wart lichen, right? So these follow into many different genuses. So when you classify things, a lot of times it's in a genus and a species name. Uh, there's many different uh, genuses that have this, or genera, excuse me, that have this, uh, but they look like little warts on the tree or on the uh, rock, whatever it's on. So that's why they're classified as wart lichen. This one's a favorite of mine. It's called script lichen. So instead of being a dot or a button, the apothecy is actually a long, narrow strip. It's not as cup-shaped. Uh, think of your cup being spread out. And it looks almost like someone has been writing all over, hence the name script. Uh, its genus name is graphis, which it's graphid is Greek for writing. So it's a really easy one to identify. If you ever see a crustose lichen, that has that long apothecia, so those long strip that's a different color and looks like writing all over it, um, it's most likely a script lichen and within that genus, the Graphis genus. Um, so it's kind of fun to just find these. Um, they can be found all over too. So this is script or secret writing lichen is a common name for it or script, uh, common script for that one. Map lichen, I did talk about this one earlier. Um, at very close range, uh, each tiny lichen has a border of black spores and resembles. Um, and so the yellow map, um, and then this is a single spore map, and it's used for lichenometry. So it's basically lichenometry tells you the relative age of an exposed rock. Um, if you're interested in this and in map lichen, just type in lichenometry, um, and there's so much information on how they actually do that. Um, so mat, mat lichen is all in one genus, rhizocarpin. Um, all right, and the la other lichen structure that you need to know in terms of the crustose lichen is the ceridia. And this is basically, think of it as the spores um, of the, the lichen. So spores are basically kind of like that seed type structure um, that is basically letting it reproduce. So the ceridia, it looks like a lot of powder almost on a lichen. Um, so hence the one that dust lichen, it's a lot of those granula ceridia, so those spores that are coming up. So it looks like almost somebody put a powder or a dust on the surface. Uh, and this is a really common one. I found this one in my backyard uh, just this afternoon, the fluffy dust lichen. It looks like a dust of green uh, all over. It's really common on trees. Uh, so this is ones you're going to find. And these are used for dyes. Uh, and it's kind of interesting to think about that, uh, that dustiness you can use for dyes. So those are all the crustose lichen we're going to go over. Those are some common groups of them. There are many others, but we're just going to go for some common ones that we find here in North America. So the next grouping is folios or our leafy lichen. And these are fun. Uh, they're usually the flattened branches, uh, the lobes. They're loosely attached. Uh, and they, remember, have that upper and lower surface. So think of them as leaves on a tree. That's what you're mainly thinking. Um, they're more two-dimensional. Uh, we'll get into the three-dimensional in just a bit. So they've got lobes. Uh, and what I, a lobe, we're talking about each one of these is a lobe that is coming off. But again, that's two-dimensional. And they also have something called risings. So this is might have confused you guys earlier um, when I asked about roots earlier in the true-false. So these little structures that come down, they look like root, but they're actually not roots. They're used to anchor the lichen to whatever they're growing on. So they're used to basically make them adhere to something, kind of like for vines, the tendrils um, on vines basically help them anchor those vines. Risings help uh, the lichen anchor itself to whether it's on a rock or it's on a tree. All right. Um, so in terms of shield lichen, this is a very common one that you're going to find. Again, I found this one in my backyard just this afternoon. A uh, green shield is a really common one. It looks like a shield. Think of uh, armor, you got your shield. 
Um, and so there's a hammer shield and it kind of looks like it's hammered. There's a rock green shield, but the most common one that you're going to find are the common green shield lichen. And so these are the ones that are green. They look almost like a circle um, or a shield. Very, very common use in dyes. Rosette lichen are kind of like the shield lichen. Um, and you can, they're named for their shape. So they kind of look like little rosettes, very similar to shields, but they tend to have um, colonies that kind of just spread out farther and farther. Um, and they tend to be more of a grayish green color um, than the actual, like the shield lichen, tend to be more of a greenish color. And these guys can really be under polluted conditions. And we'll talk about that towards the end of this talk. Um, they're all in the genus Physica. Uh, and the interesting thing about this genus, it was called Physica because at one time, they, uh, people thought that if it looked like something, it helped cure that thing. Uh, well, this lichen was found on a skull at one point. Uh, it was the first time it was discovered. And so they thought it helped with brain stuff um, and helped cure that. And so that's why it was called Physica, which is kind of interesting how things are named, right? All right, so sunburst lichen looks like a big sunburst, named for their orange color. So you have poplar sunburst, mainly found on poplar trees, common orange, uh, or elegant sunburst. And elegant sunburst was that lichen that they actually took up to that International Space Station. Uh, so this is one can is really, really hardy, can really survive extreme conditions. And what makes that orange color is the, the carotenoids that are in it. So lung lichen. All right, so this one looks to a lot of people, I guess, like the lung. Uh, so this one, it tends to be a lot bigger, the leafiness on this one. So a lot of times you think of for the leafy or the folios lichen, they tend to be really, really small. This one is nice and big a lot of times. You're gonna get a much bigger two-dimensional shape on this one. The genus is Loberia. It's actually used for lots of different things. It's used for medicines, dyes, tanning, perfumes, beer brewing, lots of different things. Um, and so this one's a really fun one if you can find it, and it tends to be a larger one. Uh, rock tripe lichen, I got one more in this group, but rock tripe lichen tends to be found on rocks. Uh, tripe, uh, because tripe if you, it kind of looks like the tripe uh, that you might eat. Um, it's actually known as a food source if it's properly prepared for both humans as well as animals, more in extreme cases, but it also can be used for dyes. Um, this one I haven't found as much around here, uh, but that doesn't mean it might not be in your area. Uh, but again, it has a bigger lobe uh, than some of the others we've talked about. And this one I really love. This one I found at the Institute, I think it was last year or the year before, and I was like, what is this? So this is dog or pelt lichen. Uh, this is much, much larger than a lot of the other ones that we were just talking about. Uh, so it's either field dog lichen, concentric pelt, it looks like basically a dog's ear or the pelt of an animal. Um, it tends to be a little, it's got those risings underneath, those root-like structures underneath. Um, it can have these little fruiting bodies here that might be bright, um, but it's very distinctive. When you see this, you know that it's either dog or pelt lichen. It's really hard to confuse it with something else. So this one's a really fun one to find. And I know it's here in Michigan. I know it's on the property at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute as well. And it grows really fast and it makes such a big structure just within one year. Um, so this one's a really fun one. All right, so those are all our folios lichen. And I know I'm going over a lot of material, but there's a lot of cool lichen out there. The last group we're gonna talk about is the fructicose or the shrubby lichen. And a fructicose, and our shrubby can come in a few different shapes, but they tend to be bigger and bushier and they can be erect or draped or tuft. Um, they have something called a hold fast. So they don't have those risings that the folios had, but it's basically just a little peg at the bottom that helps hold them onto their substrate. Um, if it's a cup, it's a little, a little at the bottom here, but it's one little holding onto that substrate. So it's not holding on as much as the crustose lichen. Um, and that is basically where you're gonna get those fruiting structures at the end. So these are the ones for the crustose. They both have the apothecia. Uh, they tend to be more of the discs, but in fructicose, they could be more like, oops, there's my whole pass there. They tend to be more like a cup at the end of a stem. 
uh, and that's where you're going to get that fruiting structure. So oak moss um, is one. It's I know it's not a moss. I don't know why we <laughs> put common names of moss in, in our lichen. But oak moss is a common one that's mainly found on oaks. It can be found on some conifers. But again, it's a really, really shrubby. Um, it tends to be held by just that hold fast at the end. Uh, but again, very shrubbery, mainly on oaks. Uh, but these are found actually in perfumes. So that's pretty cool. Uh, cup lichen. So it's got that cup at the end. Uh, trumpet lichen is one. If you've ever heard of British soldiers lichen, they tend to have a red top, a red hat almost on top of their apothecia here. Um, so that's what you're looking for for the British soldiers. They're really distinct. Uh, this one up here is dragon horn. Um, but you can tell it's a cup lichen because it's got that structure that looks like the stem, uh, almost like a wine glass, if you want to think of it that way, uh, with that cup on the end. And they're all within that same genus. But also in the genus Cladonia is our reindeer lichen. Um, so you get different types of reindeer lichen. Um, some people call it reindeer moss. Again, it's not a moss, it's a lichen. Um, it's actually called reindeer lichen because reindeer as well as caribou like to eat it. Uh, so if you find this one, I found it in just the dollar store for, before, uh, in when you're looking for the potted area, when you're trying to make floral arrangements, you can actually find reindeer lichen just for a dollar in a bag in the dollar store. Um, so that's pretty cool. I know at the Institute, if you ever go out to our sand prairie area, uh, where a lot of our box turtles also like to, to stay, um, and, and make their nests and everything. There is a lot of reindeer lichen out there. Um, so this one's a fun one to find. Um, and it's used for medicinal purposes. It can be used in alcohol, as I said, food for animals as well as decoration. So lots of cool things. Snow or foam lichen. This isn't one that I have seen a lot of. Um, it kind of looks just like foam coming out of a rock or out of the ground. Uh, it can be food for animals, uh, but it definitely is an easy one to, to identify because it looks much more foamy than the reindeer lichen. Beard lichen, hmm, I wonder what that name, the long beard, right? So you could have a bristly beard, didn't shave, but shaved somewhat recently. You could have Methuselah's beard, so really, really long. You could have one over here, which is fun. Let me see if I can move my chat box here. Uh, so this one, I uh, forget the name of it, there it is, bushy beard. So we got bushy, we got bristly beard, and we've got Methuselah's beard, um, and all these, really easy to identify because it's just so long on them. Horse hair tends to not be that greenish color that the beard lichen was. It's more hair-like um, and you could have something called moose hair or just horse hair, uh, but these are the ones where they discovered that third lichen partner uh, because some of them have some toxins in them that some are edible and some are not. Um, so those are the fun ones. Uh, as I said, they can be used for food source or medicine. And those are the three main lichen forms. I know I went through those fast. As I said, you will get a link to the information, um, but those are the three that most people concern themselves about. So if nothing else that you get out of this talk, if you can remember crustose, folios, and fructicose, or crusty, leafy, and shrubby, you're good, all right? And those three are really good on helping us understand air quality. So for example, if you go into an area that has been there for, hasn't been disturbed recently, so if, if it has just been disturbed, no worries. But if it has been not disturbed in a while and there are no lichen in that area, you know that that area has very poor air quality because remember, lichen get all their nutrients from the air. And so if there's a lot of pollutants in the air, bad for the lichen. So if no lichen, poor air quality. If you only have crustose lichen, you probably have poor air quality, all right? If you have some folios, so that leafy lichen and those crustose lichen, so crusty lichen, you could have moderate to good air quality. And if you have all three, you could have very good air quality. Now, just because you don't have the fructicose doesn't mean you don't have good air quality. Um, really, the moderate to good air quality for the folios and crustose is based on the number of different lichens. So if you have lots of different types of lichen on your property, or around where you're trying to figure out air quality, um, then you probably still have good air quality. If you find an individual lichen and you really wanna know, hey, what does it tell me? Is it sensitive to this pollution or not? 
you can actually visit this website and they, the government has classified a lot of lichen by its uh, air quality. Uh, they've been using lichen as an indicator of air quality since the 1970s. Uh, so the US government has been looking at lichen for a really long time. They really lichen their lichen. All right. Uh, this is a poem that I love that I always like to bring into any lichen talk that I do. It's uh, by Joyce Sidman and it's called The Lichen We. All right, and it's a book in a book called Ubiquitous. Who's this alone with stone and sea? It's just the lonely lichen we. The LGI, the fungus me, together bloom quietly. What do we share? We two or three together, a brave indifference to the weather, a slow but steady growing pace resembles both mud and lace. As we are now, so we shall be. If air is clear and water free, the proud but lowly white lichen we cemented for eternity. So it helps you remember that lichen, uh, what the relationship is. All right, so. I think we're running a little low on time. So I'm just gonna go skip to the end here. Um, I'm gonna skip through a few of these slides. These are just to say, we've got Crestos lichen, right? See if you knew your lichen, this should be our Fructicos, Folios. Oh, this should have been a good indicator. It should be our dog or pelt, right? Our Folios, this should have been our warty, our Crestos. British soldier, so it should be our full fructicose, excuse me. All right, so now do you like lichen? Let's see. All right, so let's find some resources. How do you go out and actually identify lichen? So I gave you lots of big groups. So there are a couple of books out there that are really good books. One is, uh, well, Lichens of North America. This is a really good book for beginners. Uh, it classifies lichen not only in the three categories that we just talked about, the crustos, the folios, and the fructicose, um, but it also classifies them by where they're found. So on rocks, on soil, or on trees. So that's a good one for beginners. If you really, really lichen your lichen, oh my goodness, here is the Bible of lichen, and it is a heavy <laughs> Bible of lichen. It is lichens of North America. There are a few scientific names that are no longer correct in here, but if you really want to get into your lichen, that's the book for you, all right? It's $100, more or less, um, on Amazon. But it's a really, really good book. Uh, but those are two books. There are other fun books out there. Uh, as I said previously, Beatrix Potter was really into lichen and was a mycologist. So there's a great book about her life. There's about lichen dyes, as well as a new book coming out for kids about Beatrix Potter, the scientist. And I love that she's looking at mushrooms right there. Um, I also have for you as resources that I'll give you this at the end, a lichen guide. So if you want to be able to map the lichen in your backyard um, and tell, figure out what your air quality is, you can do that through this guide. So I, as I said, I'll give you this link right at the end here. There's some websites that are out there. They get a little dense, again, just like that big book that I showed you, but there are some websites, some are very Michigan based, but I'm not a big fan of the websites because sometimes they just don't have the pictures that you can look at. Probably the best way to learn about lichen is an app. And I know I've said this before in many other talks that I've given, this is my favorite probably app to go out into the natural world with. It's called iNaturalist. It is free. You can get it for both your Apple phone, your Android phone. You can get a computer login and you can basically record things on your phone by just taking a picture. All right, so let's go through how you would do that. First, you need an account. So you'd need to go to inaturalist.org and create an account. It's free to do so, it's really easy to do so. You just need an email, a username, and a password. That's all you need to do, all right? So once you've created an account, if you can take a picture, either with a camera or your smartphone, you can use iNaturalist, all right? So you just go out there, you take your phone, you basically bring up the screen, and this is just a picture of what my screen would look out look like, excuse me, you click on the little camera button. I took a picture of a fungus and then I click next. Now when you take that picture, some things to consider. You want to focus on what you're interested in. If you have lots of different things in the picture, the, the, they're not gonna know what to identify. If it's not in focus, since you're trying to identify something from a picture, again, it's not gonna be very easy to identify things. 
So you really wanna take a good picture or as best of a picture as you can. But once you've taken your picture, you go, what, do you, what did I see? You click on this little arrow, and then it'll say, we're pretty sure, hopefully, it'll say, we're pretty sure it's in this genus. Uh, so they're focusing in on the one in the center here of this picture. Um, and you'll go down and look at different suggestions. And you have about 10 different suggestions you can go through, which is great. And the other great thing is that it'll pull up a lot of times a picture where it is, and usually a description as well. Um, and so it's almost like having the book right on your phone. That's the one thing I really like about this. Though you do want to have your location services on your phone or at least show where you are. You can do it just by pinching in on the map to show where you are because depending on where you are, there might be different lichen species out there. So that'll really help you identify what lichen you have. Um, and you don't have to be connected to cell service at the time. You can upload your, what you have found later. Um, but you do eventually need to upload it so that way you can check your observations. The one thing I really, really like about iNaturalist, so if I'm flipping through a book, if I'm flipping through this book, I can say, I think it's this one, but I have nobody checking my work. I have nobody saying, yes, it is that one. iNaturalist actually, you can say, I think it's this one, and then it'll click say, needs ID. And then somebody else will eventually go through a scientist usually will go through and check your work. And they will say, yeah, I think it's this, or no, I think it's something else. And so you'll get a conversation going or a dialogue going about what you have found. If it gets up to research grade, that usually means someone has identified this the same thing that you did. And so you know uh, that, yeah, that's what I found, which is the great thing. Um, so for this program, I've created our own project in iNaturalist. Uh, basically, if you go into iNaturalist, it's called Virtual BioBlitz Hike, Do You Like Lichen? If you just type in, do you like lichen, you'll get to it. Um, and I want you to, or you can go into community projects and find it that way. But it's really good to be able to, if you join the project and you take pictures, the only way to be able to know what you have and to really learn about lichen is to go out into the natural world and really start observing things. Take those pictures with iNaturalist, as I said, it's free. Um, step, start uploading and see what you get. That's the great part. Uh, so you can join the project. You can become a, a member here. These are just some of the observations I made, some not so great this afternoon. Um, but please join the project. Uh, let's make a game out of it. You can see who can make the most observations, who will get the most species. Um, I started it today, it'll go for about a week. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. It's a fun app to use. I've used it a lot. Uh, just be careful sometimes. Uh, so I've used it, for example, I was just curious what it would do for a walnut. I just took a picture of a walnut and it gave me all sorts of critters. Uh, and so <laughs> you just have to use your brain sometimes when you're using it, but somebody will double check your work and let you know that that was a critter or a walnut, not a critter. <laughs> Um, from last month, so last month we talked about dragonflies and damselflies on our bio blitz. Uh, someone got 25 observations that was in our, our actual group here, as well as identified 10 different species. But just within one week for dragonflies and damselflies, we had over 10,000 observations, 284 species that were identified, and over 18,000 identifications that were done. And so it's kind of fun. Let's make it a group effort and just see. Um, so here's my more to discover stuff, um, and this is all of the different um, activities that I've got in here. There are lichen coloring sheets if you want to actually just say, you know what, I like my lichen, but I just want to zone out and color. You can color on the lichen coloring sheets, and let me actually just quick like um, get this into the chat box so you guys, uh, oops, give me a second. Uh, I'll put this all in the chat box so you guys can get that link. So it's rebrand.ly forward slash bioblitz lichen. That's what you're looking for. That will give you a link to this, a shortened version of this presentation. It'll also give you all of these links. Um, I'll also, if you're uh, in our Zoom talk today, uh, you'll get a follow-up email tomorrow that'll give you all these links as well. 
but you'll also get a link to monitor and map lichen in your backyard, uh, as well as all these articles. So my suggestion to you is go out and discover more lichen because they are awesome out there. There are so many. So I would welcome any questions you guys have. Um, you guys have been pretty quiet. I do see a hand raised here. Let's see if somebody, let's see who's raising their hand. Looks like Patricia is raising your hand. I can allow you to talk. I apologize, I didn't get to you now. But feel free to talk, Patricia, if you uh, have a question still. Or if anybody else has a question, feel free to ask uh, in the chat box or in the Q&A box. I know I went through a lot of information in a little amount of time. Um, but as I said, this talk will be up on our Facebook page. It will also be on our YouTube channel for the Institute. Um, and you'll also, if you're signed up to, uh, through our Zoom portal, you'll also get a follow-up email for all this information because I realize there's a lot of information out there. But I hope you got a better appreciation for lichen. All right, let me stop sharing my screen for just a second and see. Someone asked earlier how lichen is dated. Oh, thank you. And how do they determine age? Yeah, all right. So <laughs> it's a lot of scientific techniques uh, to date the lichen. But there is one person um, that I know, a scientist, who basically is using gravestones or um, tombstones to map lichen year after year. So basically, she has uh, taken almost clear plastic paper, put them over tombstones, and traced around lichen. And then she has measured how lichen grow into each other and how lichen grow. So that's one study that one scientist has done to really show the growth of lichen and how they basically go into each other. The dating is usually with basically, I think carbon dating or scientific dating in that sense. So do lichen spores include the genetics of the photosynthetic partner or only the, both, uh, also the fungal partner. So it includes the genetics of both. Um, so let me, if I actually share my screen for a second, I will show you a picture that will help Clarify. Actually, I'm going to get out of this for just a minute. Nope. There we go. There we go. Stop sharing. I know. Give me one second. We're going to share one more time. I'm going to show you a picture that will help you visualize that a little bit better. There we go. Okay. So when you're looking at the structures, this is the spore like structures right here. If you can see what I'm looking at right here. And it, you can see it contains a little bit of that, both that uh, fungal hyphae, as well as that cyanobacteria and that uh, algae, depending on what that photobiont is. And so yes, it definitely contains both. Here's a blown up picture right here. Um, it contains both of them. So if you do a DNA analysis, you're going to see both of those things. So that's a great question. Thank you for that question. Um, all right, I'm just looking to see if we've got another question come in. Thank you, Lynn. I'm glad you enjoyed the presentation. I had fun researching, so I hope you, <laughs> you noticed my enthusiasm for lichen. Uh, if you like fungi and lichen and all those things, we are planning on a bio blitz in October for National Mushroom Day, all about uh, fungi, so mushrooms. Uh, and so if you, you lichen your lichen and like especially that fungal component, keep an eye out. Uh, we will be doing a bio blitz in October on fungi because that is something I love, so. All right, any other questions? Um, as I said, if you have any other questions about iNaturalist or any questions in general about lichen, feel free to shoot me an email, uh, my email, and I will put it in the chat box here. Um, but it's just my last name, uh, Holsty with an extra E for my first name, at cedarcreekinstitute.org, um, and so, if you have any other questions or like, what is this? Uh, feel free to shoot me an email. I, as I said, I enjoy talking about lichen. So let's see, Jeff asks, are those spores more like a fragment of the lichen rather than a true spore? Yes, yeah, so they are, they're partly a fragment of the lichen and they're partly a fragment of, or part of an algae or a cyanobacteria. So they're not what you consider a quote unquote true spore in terms of the fungal sense. That's why it's called a ceridia, not a spore. It's like a spore-like structure. So Jeff, you are correct. It's not a true spore. Uh, it is called ceridia. Um, so it's got a completely different name. 
Um, but it, if you think of it like a spore-like structure, it helps the uh, lichen reproduce just like a spore would or just like a seed would. So that's a really good question. So it's good to uh, specify my words, right? Perfection in that. All right, well, thank you guys so much for joining me today. I apologize for going over just a few minutes, but I hope you like and like a little bit more. See you guys.